Welcome to another sermon from the Lewis Church of Christ. And now, here's Adam. Raise your hand if you recognize this secret code. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B-A, start. I got one. <laughs> really? Up, up, down, I guess you don't, it's a secret, so you don't know it. Um, man, really? Just one. I know there'll be at least one next service. Up, up, oh, I got two. It's a brother and sister. Up, <laughs> up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B-A, start is a secret code to the Nintendo game Contra. I grew up on Nintendo. You pretty much can separate people based on what video game systems were happening in their generation. Obviously, some of you, I'm not going to go there. I don't want to, anyway. Um, you know, Nintendo, where you had, to blow in the, you had to blow in the game and smack the top of it so it would work. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. My, my little brother and I, and I, forg- I, I know we had a name for it, and I wish I could remember it because it would make me laugh. I don't know about you, you wouldn't get it, but, um, but where you, you put the game in, and because it still didn't work, even after blowing on it and stuff, so you had to put another game on top of it like to make sure it was held all the way in there and it could connect. Um, Again, you really don't get this, but if you played Nintendo, you'd get it, all right? This is like, this is it. This is, this is real life. This is doesn't, the sweet spot doesn't get much better than, than Contra. Um, but Contra, I could never beat the game. I could never beat Contra. I'd, I'd get far enough to where I was always on this, there were these steps, and there was this giant wall with this red thing that had arms that went like this and shot lasers, and I'd die every time. Every time, I just couldn't conquer the game. So, now, I have to admit to you, at this point, I didn't own a Nintendo. I didn't get Nintendo until Sega Genesis came out and Nintendo went on sale. So, my neighbor uh, had Nintendo, Andy Moses. I was over his house, and he sits down. Of course, he was that guy that had everything, so he had Nintendo Power Magazine. He sits down, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B.A., start. 30 extra guys. And he conquered, I didn't even play that day. He conquered the game because he had 30 extra guys. Now... With some non-violent coaxing, I got him to tell me what the code was so that I could do that, and I played it, and here I am, 30 extra guys. It changed the way I played the game. It was a game changer for me. 30 extra guys, now the things that seemed, the places in the game that seemed really hard, the steps with the the thing, not hard anymore. I'm ready to take risks because I know I've got 30 extra lives that I can go ahead and waste if need be, right? Right? And the places in the game that were so hard, they're not really hard. I, I, I'm, it, it changed the way I played the game. It, it really, it changed everything. And it was a secret code. The secret code was what, was what made it so that I could win, right? Now, it wasn't the secret code itself that, that made it so I could win. I still had to play the game. I still had to shoot the bad guys. I still had to fight the guy on the stairs, right? But it was the secret code that enabled me to have victory. Now, I I had an advantage, right? It didn't make me win, but it gave me an advantage so that I could win. In this month's series, we're talking about the key, and we're sharing some some lessons, uh, some secret codes, if you will, to to being successful at going beyond. Now, The keys themselves are not going to help us to win. You have to still play the game, but but they give us an advantage and and a confidence that we can go into life differently, ready to win, right? The the keys themselves are not going to give you victory. You got to enter the code. You got to turn the key. You get. You got to play. You got to use it, right? Does no good to know the code and not use it. If I start off with six guys, I'm still not going to win the game. I get 30, I can conquer that joker. I can still do it. 20 years later, I still remember the code. That's how many times I conquered the game. Because there were so many times I didn't. But you have to put it into practice. The key I want to share with you this morning comes from Jesus, and it's recorded in John chapter 8, verse 31. It's, It's just one verse, and it says this. To the Jews that believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. I love this verse. This is one of my favorite verses. I think other than Jesus wept, this was the first verse that I ever memorized from the whole Bible. John 8, 31. If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Let me give you a little context to what's happening here. Jesus is in the temple like he was 
normally he was teaching, was his habit. And there was a bunch of people there, a bunch of all different kinds of people, a bunch of Jewish people there, and, and, and who knows who else was there. And there's this really cool discourse that goes back and forth between Jesus and the people. And I'm just going to kind of rush through it and paraphrase it and just so you get the idea. Jesus says, like, I'm going away. And where I'm going, you can't go. And they're mumbling to themselves, saying, um, is he going to kill himself? Is that why he said that? And he says in verse 24, well, it, if you do not believe I'm the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. And they're going, well, who, who are you? Who do you claim to be? Well, I'm just the one I've been claiming to be all along. Same guy. I am who I said I am. And the Bible says that, that even as he spoke, many of them put their faith in him. To the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciple. These brand new believers, right? They, they, they are hearing a sermon and they believe what he's talking about. They believe he is who he said he is. They believe he's the son of God. And they put their faith in him. And he says to these brand new believers, you know, your faith hasn't been tested. If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. And this morning, the key is to going beyond. The secret code to help us win the game really is, is I want us to learn, is, is holding to Jesus' teaching. Holding to Jesus' teaching. He's talking to these Jewish people that hurl all these things about him. He said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Now, this verse has been working on me for the better part of two weeks. And, and, and I love this verse. And I really wanted to come up here and like dive into it and like break it apart and, and be so well-versed I could tell you incredible things about this verse. So that's what I'm trying to do, right? So I said, all right, let's break it down. It starts off with if. If, someone once said, is the biggest word in the Bible because it carries so much weight because it means that it's conditional. If, it's a choice. If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciple. You don't have to. That's up to you. If. I think we can rightly assert also that if you don't hold to my teaching, you're not really my disciple, are you? So he starts off with if you hold to my teaching. If you, it's personal. He's talking to these brand new believers. He's talking to believers. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. It's personal. And Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, no one else can hold to his teaching for you. You have to choose it. You have to hold to his teaching. Okay, I can, get, I can teach that. That's cool. If you hold to my teaching, okay, it's the things of God. This is Jesus talking. Jesus is teaching. All right, that's pretty big time, so we're going to pay special attention to the red letters in our Bible. But wait a second. Jesus is he's God in the flesh. So we're holding to God's teachings, which was the entirety of the Bible. So if we hold to the Bible, we're really his disciples. Right? Okay, I got that. You're really my disciples. This is what sets you apart from every other person. This is what sets you apart as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Right? And it seems as though maybe there were some people there who thought they were disciples or wanted to be disciples, and he was just like, okay, let's draw the line in the sand here. To really be my disciple, you hold to my teachings. All right, that's good. I got that. I can teach that. It's the hold to part. <laughs> The whole two part has, has, has really got me. Because I feel like hold, that phrase hold to is like the crux of this whole deal. If you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples. Now, for the longest time, I told you, this, was my, this is one of my top five verses probably. If you hold, so I've always thought hold to, it's obey, right? If you obey my teaching, you're really my disciple. That sounds like something Jesus would say, right? This means yes. Yeah. If you obey my teaching, you're really my, okay, that works. And I, what about, okay, hold to, what's it mean? If you grasp hold and hold on tight to everything I say, then you're really my disciple. Well, that sounds pretty solid teaching too. Oh, if you stand firm. You stand firm on what I'm teaching. You know that it's true and it's right then you're really my disciples. All of these things to me in my little brain seem like synonyms to hold to, right? Well, yeah, no. No. So I'm like, all right, well, I got I to gotta get this. I, I want to make sure I'm right, what I'm teaching everybody. 
And so as I, as I tackled this idea of what does holding to my teaching really mean, turns out I wasn't exactly right. And all of those things are, are right. All right. We need to obey his teachings. We need to stand firm. We need to hold tight. That's right. But this verse is so much bigger than that. What Jesus is saying here, this phrase, hold to, it's so much deeper. It, it's so much bigger. It's so much more significant. It's so much more intimate than that. And that's really all I want to share with you this morning is what that phrase hold to really means. Ah, that's my sermon. Hold to. All right? Hold to. So let me switch gears a little bit. You may remember a, a passage in John chapter 15. Jesus, he's coming off the Lord's Supper. They're heading to where he's going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's going to pray and be arrested. Right? You remember this? And on their way, he, it's him, just him and the apostles. And, and they're going through a vineyard on the way to the garden. John chapter 15, and Jesus, he uses this illustration of the vine and the branches. He's like, all right, this is, this is perfect. Imagine that. This is a perfect illustration for what I need to say to you. And he says in John 15, verse 4, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit on its own. It must, be, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you, you can do nothing. If anyone doesn't remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Now, I, I share this, this passage with you, not, be, not just because it's an incredible passage of Scripture. I mean, I guess it is. It's a really cool picture in the life of Christ, where he's headed uh, to the cross very soon. But I share this with you because the very same phrase, hold to, from John 8, 31, is in there. Did you see it? The answer is no. It's the, the same exact words that Jesus used in John chapter 8, verse 31, hold to my teaching. He uses here in John 15, only in here it's translated remain. And that changes everything for me. Listen to it again. Hold to me, and I will hold to you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must hold to the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you hold to me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a man holds to me and I to him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not hold to me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you hold to me, and my words hold to you, ask whatever you wish, and it'll be given to you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. That phrase hold to literally means to remain, to stay, to dwell, to abide, to live, to, 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 have, to start something that continues on forever, never to end. That changes John 8 31, right? Jesus is saying if you stay in my teaching, if you continue, if you dwell, if you live, in my teaching, you're really my disciple. If you continue forever in my teaching, you're really my disciples. Holding to Jesus' teachings goes far beyond knowing what he teaches. It goes far beyond reading what he teaches. Holding to Jesus' teachings, it means living your life based on them. It's so much bigger it's so much bigger. It, it means making decisions after you seek answers in his teaching. It means teaching your children and other people based on what God has taught. Holding to Jesus' teaching and by extension really being his disciple means that Jesus and his teachings are the authority over everything in your life. They are the filter to which everything else goes through. Everything goes through the Word of God. Jesus is the living Word of God. So this really makes sense, yeah? But it's so much bigger than obey or know that it's right. 
so much bigger. It, it's about reading your Bible, but with a whole new perspective. The key to winning, you got to read the Bible, but it's with a whole new perspective. It's not about academics. It's not about getting it up here. It's about getting him in here. It's not about getting uh, to know all the stuff that's written. It's about getting to know the one who wrote it. It's a whole different perspective and approach to the word of God. Church, if, if we want to succeed going beyond, Jesus' teaching must be paramount in our lives. His word, here's the cool thing, his word, the entirety of it, will always point you to him. All of it. I was just with Lydia the other day. We were talking about creation. Genesis chapter 3. It's talking to the devil. and the, the, the One's going to come that's going to stomp your head. He's going to come from a woman. First mention of Jesus is going to come from a woman. The, the Messiah. The, one, the whole Bible points to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, you've got to dwell in my teaching. If we want to grow beyond in our relationship with him, we've got to abide in him. If we want to go beyond in our compassion, we've got to stay with Jesus and watch how he modeled compassion, what he taught about compassion. If we want to go beyond in reaching others with the word of Christ, we've got to live so close to him that his good news and what he offers is on the tips of our tongues because we're right there. We know it. We experience it. We live it. We have it. It's the key to going beyond. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA start. That worked with video games really well, actually. But holding to Jesus' teachings, that works for real life. Beyond that, that works for eternal life. The hard things, they, they, they seem a little bit easier. It's the teachings of Jesus that will empower you toward finishing this race victoriously. A couple weeks ago, uh, our youngest daughter, Anna, she'll be, she'll be two on Friday. Um, we had a day off. Michelle was off. We had a family day. We had nothing planned. So I was, I was praying for a sleep in 8 o'clock day. Now, it was a prayer because 8 o'clock never happens in our home. 6.45, Anna is screaming for me. So I go in there, I'm half asleep, she's half asleep, and in her half asleepness, she got her legs stuck out through the slat in the crib. And she can't figure out how to get it out because she's half asleep. So she's screaming, and so here I am, daddy, knight in shining armor, I pick her up and I carry her to our bed because I'm praying she's going back to sleep. <laughs> so I put her down on my chest, and she's just, ugh, she's squirming like crazy. All right. So I start rubbing her back. She squirms even more, because now I'm not soothing, I'm tickling. Um, so after that, all that squirming, she just she rolls over between Michelle and I. And she's squirming. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, she's cute as a button, but this was really annoying. <laughs> it was driving me bonkers. Then she starts trying to get up. Now, if you've ever seen a kid try to get up holding a blanket while the blanket's like underneath them, it's not possible. So she's struggling, I mean hard, and, and I'm imagining in my mind if this was a cartoon, she'd yank real hard and she'd like flip, right? So that's, that's the, you're getting the picture. She's, she's got her lovey, which is like a stuffed animal with a blanket, and she's trying to pull it up, and I know as soon as she gets up, she's going to say, Daddy, can we go watch Mickey? I know it's coming. So I'm hoping she doesn't get the blanket off from underneath her and she quits and gives up. She finally gets up to her knees. And I'm ready for the question. I'm like, I'm chalking it up. I'm getting up. And she looks at me, and she looks back at Mommy, and she starts backing into me. Like, like for real. Backing into me as close as she can possibly get to me. To the point where she's got really thin, thin strands of hair, and it's like on my nose, and it's tickling me. And so I'm like, all right, backing up, and she won't stop. She's She's trying to get as close as she possibly can to me, her back up against my chest, where I don't know if she can feel it, but I can feel my own heart beating at this point against her. And when she got there, now, I'm not a small person. Anna is. She's tiny. She, like, disappeared into me. 
right? And she got her lovey in one arm, and she got her fingers in her mouth, and she laid her head down on her pillow, on my pillow, and she went to sleep. She was where she wanted to be. She was, she was tucked into daddy's arms, peaceful and warm and protected and comfortable and asleep. And that's when it hit me. I should know better than put my kids in my sermons. Um, <laughs> that's when it hit me. You and I, we squirm and we struggle in the discomfort of our own skin, of this world, of what it offers we we just want to be comfortable, and I don't mean complacent comfortable. I mean just we're at a place where we're, we know we're protected and, and we're warm and we're confidently able to say it's all good. We long for that, that peace, right? And it was that moment with my little girl that made me understand that's what it means to hold to Jesus' teaching. When His words... And the living word, he himself, consume me. They envelop me. They wrap their arms around me. They guide me in everything. And rather than it being obedience just to a mere command, I long to be there. That's where I want to be. That's where we want to be. Jesus' teachings will always draw you closer, more intimate into his heart. Hold to means to dwell, to live, to abide right there. And that changes everything. And when I'm right there, then I know I'm his. I'm really his disciple. Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciple. My prayer for you leading up to today and this morning not that you'd leave here with a to-do list or, or a how-to, but I want to. My prayer has been that you would leave here today changing the way you approach the Word of God, where you approach it as the living Word of God, Jesus, first. And that you long to be so right there with Him. It consumes you. And if it changes everything for you because the words of Jesus are now in you and they transform you from the inside out. This has been a presentation of the Lewis Church of Christ. We are located at 15183 Coastal Highway, Milton, Delaware, three miles north of Lewis on Highway 1. Our service times are 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. every Sunday morning. 